Okay, we're going to get started. Um, so thank you all for joining us today, um, well, this evening, and welcome to our Becoming Conservationist edition of Passports. Today, we're so lucky and excited to have Beric, Derek and Beverly Joubert, um, the founders of Great Plains, as our special guests. Uh, the Joubert's are award-winning filmmakers, conservationists, and explorers from Botswana, and we're so thrilled to have them talk about how they became conservationists, what got them going, how they see the future of conservation in Africa. Um, and they'll also talk about their camps, a little bit about slow travel and the ex excellent work that they're doing on the African continent. The duo has produced over 40 films for Nash Geographic, published 12 books, half a dozen scientific papers, and authored many articles for Nash Geographic magazine. Their talks worldwide are often sold out in minutes, um, and their TED Talk has attracted millions of views. Extraordinary Journeys has known the Joubert's for a really long time, and they've been amazing partners of ours. Um, not only do they have incredi incredible camps throughout Africa that we love sending our clients to in Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Kenya, but they're also doing groundbreaking work on the ground with their charitable organizations, foundations, including the Big Cats Initiatives, uh, Rhinos Without Borders, um, Great Plains Conservation, and they all coincide, coincide with one aim, which is to save the wild places of Africa and protect the creatures that depend on them. As people are talking about regenerative tourism, the Joubert's are our pioneers, and we want to support people like them who are doing fantastic work in Africa and beyond. Um, here at Extraordinary Journeys, we feel it's our duty to support people like the Joubert's. We spend a lot of time finding places where you're actually supporting something more significant when you stay there than just visiting a camp. So we hope you enjoy the conversation tonight. Um, one of the significant causes that we at EJ are donating to is the Female Rangers program, which we'll also hope you'll contribute to. We specifically chose um, the Female Rangers program because we're a women, um, a company founded by women, um, founded by a mother-daughter duo, and it's super important to us to continue supporting more women in the travel industry, and we love seeing women on the ground, um, especially women who are not typically known for having these kinds of jobs. Um, so it's a cause that's dear to, dear to our heart, which you'll learn more about tonight. Um, protecting Africa is not an easy feat, so we need all the help we can get. Um, so we'll let the Joubert's take it away. I've gone ahead and muted everybody, so feel free, feel free to use the chat box um, to type in your questions, and then we'll take note of them, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, and we also suggest that you go to the top of your screen and click on the button to put your screen in speaker mode so that you'll see just as you bears and not a screen full of names. Um, so yeah, we'll let them take it away. Thank you. Right. Well, good evening, everybody. Yeah, thank you. And I love your title, Becoming Conservationist. Uh, we see ourselves as emergen emergency conservationists, but I'm hoping you're speaking to your whole audience and everyone on the chat is going to be a conservationist. So fantastic, great title. So yeah, <clears throat> um, this is really going to be us sitting around the campfire and talking to you, and most certainly outside because we happen to be in Washington DC now. Uh, it feels like sitting in the smoky side of the campfire. <laughs> uh, our, ear, our, our eyes are streaming and it feels like I need a good gin and tonic to get through this. But um, uh, no, welcome and thank you very much. What we are going to do is um, show you a couple of images and talk you through some video clips, which uh, um, we'll get through in a moment. But in essence, um, what we want to convey is that tourism is vitally important to conservation in Africa today. Um, very often people feel that they traveling is a little bit of a burden on the environment, and most certainly we've got to watch that. But uh, almost the biggest thing you can do for Africa is come out, get there, um, share those experiences with us, because not only do we leave conservation jobs behind, but uh, uh, initiatives behind, but uh, we give jobs to a lot of people. We went into the pandemic with 600 staff. We didn't let anybody go. We kept everybody in salaries. Uh, and we came out of the pandemic with 800 staff. I don't know where the 200 arrived from, but anyway, we... Uh, not the best business strategy, but um, we grew this company through through this COVID time. Um, and it's based on the fact that we really started out, our origins are in Africa, and we really wanted to, um, to get the finest of the finest places and bring those to you. And really how we started Let's with Great Plains 
is um, uh, we were looking at all the work that we do do, which is through film and uh, video um, exhibitions, books, and of course, everything that we do at the core of it is conservation. But we knew we were missing uh, one part of it, and that was protecting the land. And so 16 years ago, we started Great Plains, and Great Plains is all about how can we keep those vulnerable the vulnerable areas alive. They become corridors. They're not in national parks, but at the same time, work very closely with the communities so that they are protecting it themselves. They are the future ambassadors uh, for these areas. And so that's how Great Plains started. So through our Great Plains Foundation, we actually have two arms. One is uh, doing the conservation work, um, assisting in protecting wildlife. And the other is working very closely with communities, communities is doing everything from education uh, programs, conservation camps, and of course, um, you know, the individual empowerment programs that you heard a little bit from Alicia earlier. But I think what we'd like to show you, just to take you back um, to how we started, we really started as filmmakers. Uh, filmmakers that were uh, incredibly enthusiastic, keen to understand Africa. And the reason I'm showing you this is many um, of these uh, scenes are scenes that you possibly will come out and see. Uh, but they're also scenes that we captured in the early 80s, 90s, into 2000. We were very fortunate to have groundbreaking scenes where we discovered new behavior, new signs, and our question today is always, if we don't remind ourselves how breathtaking and unusual um, these scenes are, if we don't protect these areas through all the land that we're protecting through Great Plains, there won't be scenes and there won't be um, new discoveries and there won't be these great corridors that are so important. We've got 1.2 million acres that we're protecting through Great Plains. So let's go back first before we move on by looking at the video. So let's run that video if we can, Alicia. So if we bring up the next image, so um, 
At Great Plains, we have tents exactly like that, and we expect guests to come to see us to wash the wash it down and to help us fix it. And um, no, we don't. We've upgraded a little bit since then. Um, the origin of this really is that we were seeing these extraordinary places as explorers, and we were able then to handpick some of the most unbelievable landscapes where we could uh, ourselves work in. And, and have these incredible scenes that we've just seen there. And then we started Great Plains. And the origin of that was we looked at where the big cat populations were when we were, say, 15 years before the beginning of Great Plains, 10 years, five years on the day we wanted to start this company and then where they would be five to 10, 15 years from then. And so we looked at this as where we should be, not just from an iconic species and exposure point of view, but where we could do the most good, uh, where we could work with the communities and work with the conservation in the area. The conservation is obviously key to us. Uh, the camps are key to us, and obviously so are the communities. So if we can run that next piece, and you'll see how we've managed to upgrade some of our camps. <laughs> So this is Tampa Plains in Zimbabwe, right along the Zambezi River. And it truly is spectacular, the river. Everything about elephants, hippo, crocodiles, everything is happening there. And this is exactly where we are doing our big model. Decide your place to bring families, little ones, uh, to get out on the river. Put the back the river. You can put it on the What is really special about this place is the there's a top side hide and an underground hide. This is what the elephants, they just say to elephant sound, animals running through. We are definitely protecting the largest. Um, over at Yuka and more of the expedition camp uh, set in the middle of the Mara, but on a public surface.
Sorry, there was a little bit of a technical thing there. We actually can't hear you, Derek and Beverly, while the video audio is playing. So um, we can either, you, if you can repeat what you said in those videos would be amazing. Um, and then the next video, I can pause it as we go, just so that everybody can hear all the amazing things you had to say about the properties and what's coming. That's fine. We're actually just talking amongst ourselves about uh, uh, anyway. But uh, and of course, uh, what we'll do is we'll talk before the video so that you've got one audio channel running going forward. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so what we were saying in there was really that the um, and yeah that we that we've designed these new camps now. Uh, Timbo Plains, the first one we, you saw along the Zambezi, is great for water activities, and then. The one uh, sort of Tunga camp where you saw the shaggy head antelope running, um, the uh, sort of Tunga is the, we see five or six, ten of them every day from the camp. Uh, designed the camp in these great basket shapes, like fishing baskets, and um, just had a lot of fun with that. All of our camps this year, over the last uh, eighteen months or so, have been completely refurbished, including Old Danya, Mara Nika, which is where you saw the cheetah hunting. Um, but all of them have just been redone. And then we've uh, built some family suites uh, in three of the Kenya camps. So that's Mara Plains, Mara Nika, and Mara Expedition, and then did a major refurb in um, Aldonia. Uh, the exciting part about Aldonia is that we've got that beautiful uh, low-level hide that you can actually sit all day. You don't even have to go out and just enjoy the time with elephants. Advance uh... To the next slide. Can you get, can you also just speak to what um, there was a section there about what's coming that we couldn't hear you speaking to as well in that video? Yes, so, so we do have another camp um, that we are planning to uh, open in 2025 at Champoli, uh, which is a, along a lake, uh, Lake Natron. And but that uh, we have just been on site and the building all starts next year. And where is that? So that's in southern Kenya on the Kenya-Tanzania border. And then the, the secret that we're not talking about was the next three images, uh, which were gorillas. And so watch the space. Also by 2025, there'll be a gorilla experience uh, coming out of Great Plains. So let's move it along to the next image. Um, where really and truly we wanted to talk, and we'll talk a little bit about this before and let you enjoy the video, um, but really and truly in conservation, there are these, these allies uh, to, to change the planet. And we work very, very strongly with, with communities, uh, in particular through when they're in need, through drought conditions, and Beverly will talk about the, the the move we made in this last few months. Yeah, so the community had just come out of the pandemic, you know, borders opening, tourism starting. So everybody, you know, felt like they just got through it. And then, of course, a major drought hit in Kenya. And so that was really tough for them. Um, over a period of, say, two years, uh, they started losing cattle, but towards the end, about 75% of their cattle. So their cattle were um, really skin and bone. Uh, the the uh, community uh, was struggling, especially to nourish their kids. And so we took that on. But we decided that one way to nourish their kids would not be at home, but at school. So a little sneaky in so many ways, because we wanted to nourish their brains at the same time. Uh, and um, uh, we received immense gratitude uh, a couple of weeks ago whilst we were in Kenya, when um, uh, many from the 50 schools that we are feeding, uh, many uh, we had an individual woman from each school come and give gratitude with all the elders. And I must say it was a very emotional um, uh, ceremony that they gave because we didn't expect that, we didn't ask for it at all. And it truly uh, showed their gratitude in supporting their kids. Let's watch that piece.
and then let's move on to the next. So the the what this is really all about is a good number of years ago, um, we had an accident with uh, Buffalo. Beverly was put in hospital. And uh, while we were there recovering from that, both of us, uh, we started thinking about how we had been given a second chance. And so, and I'm sure there are questions about how we pick our projects. But um, we now go forward when we're dealing with the community or with a couple of rules of engagement. The second is we really want to give people a second chance. So those that uh, are suffering in schools and could head off in, the, in a different direction, a little bit of a full feed schooling program, um, 11,800 children, we've made a big difference in their lives. We've just, for example, put in uh, an eye clinic, a roving eye clinic, and we found out that almost 60% of the kids could not see the front of the, the school, the, the room, so they couldn't read the blackboard. So just giving them a little bit of a second chance has been really important to us. Um, within their homes themselves, light and power and electricity is another thing that they really just need some help on. So in many of these areas, um, you know, along the Okavango, uh, they have never been on the grid. And so we wanted to assist them in getting power. And the best way we could do it is empower the woman to be able to learn solar board electronics. We discovered Barefoot College in India, and uh, we selected uh, a group of women to go back to, to India and learn with a lot of the other women around the world. And it truly was phenomenal. They were there for six months. They came back and they really became global, global citizens in so many ways, but so excited to have power in their hands to give power to the people. And so now we've got the community in the area with little solo uh, panels on the grass huts. So let us show you a just tiny little taste of the excitement from the, the woman. I am honored to the Great Plains and the Bayfield College for giving me this opportunity to come and gain this huge experience of installing solar. And so one of the things that we've really adjusted in our, in our strategy and tactic over the years is um, uh, that we need to go into these situations and not superimpose something that we think they need, uh, but ask them what they need. And in, in this case in particular, we were, we were surprised that what what these women mostly wanted was to be able to set up their own businesses, not to just get handouts and to start a sort of uh, ver our version of microfinancing all based on this. And one of the things we discovered from this is that there were almost unintended consequences. So now these women uh, have so many other benefits from having light, right? Absolutely. And so one of the other benefits, and you can go to the next slide, um, is uh, working with the woman that wanted to be part of protecting the landscape. Uh, they want to be conservationists. Uh, they're most excited about being able to mentor their children. So whatever they're learning, and uh, we thought the program um, as our new woman ranger program was going to take a six month um, course, but we're discovering to really make it's um, incredibly safe for them and for them to have as much knowledge as um, all the other rangers. Uh, it's taken um, a whole year and we've already included the next uh, seven ladies to join them. So this is a pretty successful program. Uh, they, uh, they are embracing it in an, a remarkable way. Uh, they are the eyes and ears 
Of course, they're trained on radio. They'll be able to alert, um, you know, anti-poaching teams to come in, as well as the Botswana Defence Force or in Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwean Defence Force. And um, they are working also very closely with the communities so they can educate uh, the communities on conservation. Uh, the exciting part, though, is what they can do with the children as well. Uh, so they're embracing it. And just to give you a little feel on how they feel about the work that they are doing. Let's play that video. Wildlife and natural habitat need us to protect it because some people out of ignorance and some out of selfishness end up killing and destroying natural habitat. So it needs us to protect it. Being a female ranger, you take care of animals, you protect them from poachers, and you learn ways in which to protect them from extinction. So what was amazing about this is um, the response that we got. As we put out a call to action or put an ad in the newspaper, or just these, I think there were 24 positions available. Within 24 hours, we had 200 applications. Uh, a real indication that women in Africa want to play a role in the conservation of Africa. They want an African solution, and they want to be at the table, in fact, in the field, in, uh, in sorting this out. Um, so we were very encouraged with this. And these are tough ladies. They are learning to drive. They are learning first aid, how to be safe out there. They're learning how to use firearms. Um, the training is very, very well-rounded. Out of Zimbabwe, we may even be able to, in fact, we've had some applications from women who already know how to fly helicopters. So uh, this is a program that's going to roll and expand and in time, I think that we will get to 100, maybe 200 women rangers. Absolutely. So this is real empowerment, uh, female empowerment. Uh, but... I don't want the men to think, well, you know, where's the empowerment for, for the, the, the men out there? I mean, we have uh, projects that are both for, for all genders, but today we're focusing on the woman empowerment because of Elizabeth and Marsha being such powerful women at Extraordinary Journeys. And indeed, as I often say, I'm in touch with my feminine side as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so then just to go a little back to the, the, um, the female rangers, uh, Extraordinary Journeys has assisted in helping us make it happen. And that's really supporting, uh, you know, a ranger, a female ranger. You know, we've got to buy everything for them, the, the boots, the binoculars, the clothing, but the training over a year is expensive. And it's just a, a wonderful acknowledgement to Extraordinary Journeys for all that support. So you've seen how um, some of our work involves children looking at the future. And I often say that if you do a, a walk in the bush, you need to look down at your feet at the immediate and at the horizon. And if you're not looking around you, you will trip and fall on your face. And if you're not looking at the future, you won't know where you're going. So for us, looking at the future, looking at the children is the future. So you see that component of our lives and the work that we're doing. Then this program is a sort of crossover where we're looking at the future, but we're also working with these women to, to fix a real problem today. And then, of course, looking at conservation, there's this bridge from the communities via these women into our conservation work. So a couple of years ago, we started moving rhinos, as many of you know. And uh, we can report now that from the 87 rhinos that we brought into Botswana from high poaching zones in South Africa, uh, we've had about 70 babies now. Yeah. So we consider it a massive success. And um, we grandparents many times over. Over and over and over. So can we go to the next slide? 
So more recently, um, uh, early last year, um, we got a call from a group that uh, felt that there were too many elephants in the southern part of Zimbabwe and needed our help to depopulate them. Now, there are very few ways to de depopulate um, any areas in my mind. The one is to hunt and kill them or shoot them. The other is to move them. And so we said, of course, we'll help and we'll move. And uh, so we then set about trying to, to, to get these animals on the move, get them going. Uh, and that involved darting when we got into it. It's a, a shopping list of about 3,000 animals, including 400 elephants. So we started last year um, and we've already moved 101 elephants. Um, and some other animals, 200 other animals, roughly. And this is a, a clip of what we recently shot during that move.
So when we take anything on, we take it on and, and really take on the energy, you know, of the animals that we, we're working with. And so it was hard not to feel what those elephants were feeling. Uh, we were very emotional. Every single person that was involved and hands-on uh, had tears rolling down their cheeks. And so it is very cathartic. And um, I do think that we all need uh, to have that cathartic um, feeling and release. And often animals, you know, give it to us. So we'd love you all to join us in helping to move the next 3,000 animals that we will be relocating, you know, to Zimbabwe, to the Zambezi um, River. Uh, Timber Plains, we showed you a little clip on Timber Plains as those doors opened. Uh, that's where you would come and stay and then be able to see the elephants that we have moved. And what we can tell you that 101 of the elephants, so that's what we've moved to date, um, are moving around. They're absolutely fine. They straight away walked into the wind to see for their own security and so they could smell and see if there was any danger. But a year later, they're still in the area. So it has been highly successful. They haven't tried to leave. They understand that they truly are in a, an incredible paradise. And so this year, um, in July to August, we're hoping to be able to start the program because we have to move it in the winter months. We can't relocate any of the animals in the summer. It's way too hot. And what you see here are local teams, uh, at least 100 Zimbabweans uh, picked locally, and uh, they've really invested in this process as well. Um, so we're hoping that uh, this will be a program that we actually we complete the 400 uh, elephants and 3,000 other animals, but we're already in discussions with other countries to see whether they need animals as well, and, and it'll become a part of our lives. So rewilding areas is going to become an ever more important conservation tool for all of us. Um, but for us, really what it is, is as Beverly said, it's that cathartic uh, leaning forward and trying to see where we can, where we can help. Without help, these animals have got a very short future. This is giving these elephants a second chance as well. So really and truly, that's what it's about. We, uh, we are desperate that uh, our work and our camps and our company and all the people within us uh, can pull together with you and make sure that those ori original images that you saw in the first video clip, clip of our video with National Geographic over the years uh, don't become a sort of record of dinosaurs and of animals that have disappeared in our lifetimes. It's time for us all to be emergency conservationists and, um, and to, to come on extraordinary journeys with extraordinary people uh, doing extraordinary things. So that's what we got for you. And Derek and Beverly, can you speak a little bit about... Um... I know we've talked about this before, but I think our guests would be really curious to know, like when they're coming to stay at Tembo Plains, what can they see? How can they get involved um, with this project? What did that look like? Well, definitely. So obviously the, uh, the the movements are in a sort of staccato fashion, depends on the herds that we move in. Uh, we don't move them every day. What we've actually done is the first group that we moved, well, we spent a couple of months this last year. And then we wanted to go through four full seasons to see how these animals adapted to the habitat, how they, the big thing is, how they integrated with the existing and resident elephants there. And of course, as Beverly said, they haven't gone away. And in fact, the, the really interesting science here is that uh, they are able to speak the same elephant dialect from the southern part of Zimbabwe to the northern part in where they are now. Um, a separation that's happened for about 100 years. They haven't been able to do that and about 500 miles. So we were really interested in this elephant communication and whether that was going to be easy or hard. And so all of that science is going on as we speak. We've got woman rangers in place monitoring these animals. We've got scientists in place making sure that we're finding out as much as we can about their movement, their stress levels, the communication, uh, we've got camera traps in place looking at the uh, the uh, lions and other predators in the area. So coming into Tembo Plains, we're sort of encouraging people to, to not just hit the river or go out on a game drive, but to work with the or visit with the rain, female rangers 
and the scientists to get a slightly deeper dive into conservation, hands-on conservation in Africa. And we're monitoring them because the matriarchs all have collars. So we're monitoring them every six hours so we know exactly where they are. We obviously um, don't want to um, get too close to them. We want them to be able to feel that this is their home. and and um, But they are also um, meeting up with other matriarchs that are from the area. And so this is a really exciting part about it, is that they've integrated. Uh, the forest is absolutely fine. We had um, a specialist in there saying that it is not a, a naive forest. So we know that with the forest um, um, behaving the, the way a wild forest would, that they are going to be absolutely comfortable in the area. There's enough for them to feed without them destroying the forest. So I think that is also important. Many people have asked about that. And another part that they've asked is, will they try and go home? Uh, they have a journey of over 500 miles uh, to, and you know, which took by vehicle about uh, 20 hours. And they've never tried to go back because there's a huge escarpment that they've got across. But I also believe it's because they truly are in a area that they understand they are safe. They understand from the elephants that are in the area, as Derek was talking about the communication, but they also have a paradise around them. They've got enough water and enough food for themselves. Um, Do you want us? Why don't we go um, on to stop the sharing and then? Oh, there we go. Questions. <laughs> I've got a few questions. <laughs> um, now, why don't we open it up for questions then? And why don't we um, stop sharing so that we can see each other? Yes. Give me one second. We have um, already a few questions that have come in, so we'll answer those ones first. But I'll just stop sharing the screen. We had a question from, uh, well, first of all, thank you guys so much. That was so interesting and incredible. We have lots of questions that have come in. So from Debbie Gordon, we had a question that was, where is the best place to see the highest concentration of elephants? Well, depending on the time of the year, one of the things that we like doing is um, getting into the Cylinder Reserve in Botswana. Uh, so probably from July, August, September, definitely September and into October. And then the fun things that we've done, we did this for a film we did, Soul of the Elephants, where we got out on canoes and paddled down the cylinder spillway. Uh, and literally, Debbie, we had uh, elephants on both sides of us within 10 or 15 paces either way, and just uh, moving through them like a herd, because they don't anticipate you coming from the river. So the highest concentration of elephants is most certainly in the cylinder concession. Yeah, the cylinder concession. And so that means you could stay at two different camps. One would be uh, the cylinder lodge and then the other Zarafa, because mm -hmm. Zarafa is right along the um, Lake uh, Stavarianja. And a lot of the elephants come and concentrate around there as well. I had that exact experience when I stayed at your cylinder camp. I think I'm spoiled for elephants for the rest of my life after being there, but like seeing them crossing the river by the dozens, it's so incredible. Um, so the other thing is, if I can extend, is so that's that, and that's that's active and it's really interesting. But another one of my favorite things is to get down into the sunken hide at Aldonia Lodge, uh, where we've we've put this hide in, and it's it's again within ten paces of the elephants, the waterhole. But some of the last big tuskers in East Africa go there. And you have this incredible view where the tusks are coming right across in front of you, almost getting splashed by water. And we've just redone the hide so you can sleep down there as well. OK, and then we had another question um, that didn't get quite get the details you said about Sitatunga camp, I think, because the, the video was playing over. So maybe if you could repeat a little bit of that information for them. So Siddhartha Camp is opening in about a month's time. It's on an island, quite a small island in the Okavango in Botswana. And uh, we've always wanted to, to bring a purely uh, or, or the purest form of the Okavango to you. <clears throat> and so when we were designing this, we had to look at it, and you will have seen some of the shapes of the, of the, of the rooms itself. Uh, the Bayer people developed these fishing baskets about that big. 
um, and the fish swim into them and they can't turn around. So when we were designing that, we, we draw on that fishing basket shape and then blew it up to the size of a room. So we've got these, these rooms, luxury rooms, but shaped like fishing baskets up in the trees. And uh, on the island itself, there's walking, good leopard on there as well. But the big thing is the Sitatunga. So these very, very rare antelope are these shaggy, uh, big shaggy animals, um, curved horns and with splayed hooves so they can walk on the reeds. And you see them almost nowhere else in the world. We see them every day at Sitatunga camp. Amazing. Um, and then we have a question from Elizabeth that is, how do you choose your projects? <laughs> It's a really passion. <laughs> we we really have to love it and feel it. Uh, and um, of course, a lot of the areas where we see that they're issues, they're iconic areas, but they're vulnerable. And the vulnerability of those areas, we understand that if we can, if we can work closely with the communities, if we can get the lease and take it over, uh, we will, um, you know, to, uh, go in there. So for instance, Cylinder, and so I'm going to just use uh, Cylinder as an example, that was a, a, a prime example, is it used to be a hunting concession. And we took it over, we stopped hunting from day one, and we knew we had to make it sustainable to make it um, work, and, um, you know, both the camps. So Cylinder then became um, a we now refer to it as Cylinder Reserve, but it's not a national park. And uh, we have a few camps in there. That's everything from Zarafa, Cylinder, and then Cylinder Explorers. And now we've got Okavango Explorers. That's right down at the bottom, but that's 360,000 acres. So it's a hundred beds in 360,000 acres. So you really do feel like a true explorer. Then another, um, example is uh, this new one that we're talking about, uh, Timber Plains, where we also took the lease over, stopped the hunting six years ago, and started to slowly let it rewild naturally. But with this opportunity with animals that were going to die in the southern part of Zimbabwe, it just made perfect sense to be able to rewild it. And that's why this rewilding of the Zambezi is so important because it is creating back that paradise that it once was. And that's really what we, we look at. Um, our projects are, can we as individuals and can we as Great Plains uh, turn an area around for the better? Otherwise we don't take it on. So also I think that from a company perspective, we have this policy and we don't always adhere to it. Uh, and I flippantly call it ready, aim, fire, uh, where we, we have a look at something we think about it, we set our targets, and we go for it. And generally, we actually don't do that. But when it comes to the foundation and the other stuff we're doing, it's basically, is there a need? Conservation, grab onto it immediately. But things like studying the animals, studying lion behavior, studying elephant behavior, that can come afterwards. Uh, we're in this phase, we're all in this collective phase of uh, being, needing to be emergency conservationists. There are needs happening right there, right now. Uh, reacting to the, the drought and, and, and feeding 11,800 kids a day. If we'd done a, a feasibility study on that, we would have kids would have died. Uh, so you've got to react quickly. And so we're very nimble. We jump on it. it means we make some mistakes from time to time, but we, we hopefully do quite a bit of good as we get in there. We've had a few questions kind of asking similar things like how can people um, get involved? Can they work with elephants? Can they get, how can they get involved with your projects and what does that look like? So like in Tembo Plains, the, the best sort of hands-on involvement is coming out to Tembo, Tembo Plains. Um, and if we're moving elephants in at the time, <clears throat> there's that opportunity. We can't predict when we're going to be moving the elephants in. The best involvement really is uh, within the community work that we're doing, obviously, if there are elephants coming in, but uh, working then with the uh, female rangers. And I would encourage actually everybody uh, who comes out to us in Africa to sit down and have a conversation about what they are really good at, because so often a, a safari is seen as being um, one of those destinations or activities where you come out, you have a look at a whole bunch of lions, and then you go home again. And if you, you know, you come out and you've got a good guide and he shows you a lot of those. 
things. But we encourage our guys to ask questions of you and to say, um, what do you get good at? And, and so often our guests are, are eye specialists or dentists or um, have made a couple of billion dollars on the stock exchange or whatever it might be, professors. And I think imparting that knowledge uh, turns our, our company into the university of life. So you're already participating by the time you, you get there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have another question or more of a statement, but it seems that women play a big role in your projects. Is that a correct observation? Speaking of the female rangers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, that really all started in 2017 uh, when I was lying in hospital and um, we were interacting with all the nursing sisters. And I was in a particular hospital in South Africa that was um, a training hospital at the same time. So we had women from right around Africa that um, we could talk to, uh, almost do a, a journalistic investigation on how they felt. And overall, the common thread was that they did not feel empowered. Uh, many of them were abused. They all worried about their female child, whether the, you know, there was going to be an issue of abuse. And, um, and so we thought, why not? They're so passionate. They want to uh, be empowered and they want to be part of the um, conversation. And that is how do they protect their environment? And so we escalated. It's not that we didn't do any projects before, but we escalated our projects um, from then on. And it's everything from you know, education. We've also started uh, a Basadi Empowerment Trust, which is uh, having shares within our company. And uh, as Derek mentioned earlier, you know, the micro businesses, so micro financing. Um, the women are also involved through the education. Whenever we do education or if we have a conservation camp where we bring the kids out to all the camps uh, twice a year, uh, we'll always bring the school teachers and, it, and you know, majority of them are women. So we're not only training the kids, but we're tra tra training the women. And so it's just opening up a new curriculum, but a new way of living in their environment. You know, often they learn everything uh, that, that is happening in Botswana, in the capital and everywhere else, but never on how to live side by side with wildlife. And so bringing the women in, the nurturers, um, has really been important. We've seen a, a remarkable difference, but we've also um, got 50% of the women in our camps, um, you know, I should say of our staff, are women, and they're great in hospitality. A lot of our guests have left saying, my gosh, we fell in love with the area, we fell in love with the wildlife and all the unique scenes that we saw, but boy, we will remember the people forever. Um, and then we have another question that is surrounding that, but how do you select the female rangers from all of those applications? You said that you got so many, how did you narrow it down? So it comes down to, so their prior qualifications are not that important. We're about to take them in and, uh, and train them from start. It's heart and soul. So is this person really going to be dedicated? It doesn't have to be dedicated immediately, but is this the sort of person who's really going to be dedicated to a life in the bush? And also for some of them, can we take some of them and turn them into trainers? Because what's really important to us is that women are able to get to that place where they can train other women uh, rather than have, as you saw in that video, we've got a, a ranger in there with a rifle and he's teaching a whole lot of women. But women want to be want to have certain conversations with other women. So we're training trainers and there's that. But also, to be very honest, it's a difficult job and it's, they've got to stay in the bush for a long period of time. And so if they have very complicated home lives, it may not be for them. And mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a very quick um, selection process. So do the, this is a question for me, but do the women who have children, what does that look like for them? Well, in many of these communities that we're working with, women do have children and then go to the workplace and leave. And it's a wonderful system, actually. They leave uh, growing children with their mothers uh, very often. It doesn't matter whether they're going to the bush or not. 
And so Africa is the perfect environment for these women to go off and do these jobs if they've got a stable environment at home. Um, okay, and then we have back to the rewilding project. What are the other animals being relocated and when will they be relocated? All right, so we're extending the rewilding project. In fact, we've, we're talking about 400 elephants, but the last communication we had over the last two weeks has been whether we could extend this to 1,000 elephants. Uh, that certainly would be the largest rewilding exercise in history. Uh, but of course, the answer from us is always yes. So it's elephants, it's buffalo. In another part of Zimbabwe, we are moving giraffe and zebra and wildebeest, impala, eland, lions, wild dogs. Um, and more recently, because of the, the this project, um, and there's probably a question about whether it's only Zimbabwe, but the uh, we're probably going to be doing this again up in Central and East Africa uh, with the same crew, with the same team. We really do now seem to have got a bit of a reputation of being able to move animals around in, in big animals around in mass. And so uh, we most certainly are courting the invitation from uh, an East African country as well. And how long do you think these re relocations um, take? All right, so we continue in this year and then it'll be next year and probably the year after. You wanted to say something? Right? Somebody else gonna say something? No. Oh, okay. Um, and then there's a question from Marsha saying, do you foresee relocation taking place in other areas, which you just touched on? Um, did you want to elaborate on that at all? You want to you talk go? about Uganda? No, I don't. I'm just saying that in East Africa, there's an opportunity there. So yeah, we're open for business. If there's a, one of the great things um, about what's happening, well, there's some good and bad things, but so with 8 billion people, um, and certainly a billion of them soon in, in Africa, uh, there's a population problem. But what's happening to that population is they're starting to concentrate. And so we're seeing these clusters of human population going into the cities and, and around the cities. And, what, and there seems to be a slow disinvestment in livestock. So many of the young Maasai or the Samburu, for example, don't really want to take on the traditional jobs of herding livestock. And so they're looking for other work and largely humanity works in clusters in the cities. But that means that uh, large parts of Africa are being left largely uninhabited by people, also denuded of wildlife. But for anybody involved in rewilding, there's an opportunity there if there are places where there's a high population to move these high populations into those very, very low populations and rewild them. Um, and that's really, really important because one way to rewild these areas um, and one benefit of rewilding these areas is that you, you stimulate the biodiversity and that stimulates the carbon absorption and you sort of kickstart the machine. Um, we are at time, but there's a couple more questions. So if you guys want to stick around, you can. In a few different ways, we've kind of had a few people ask um, how, what can travelers and our clients do to support travel as a force for good, um, to travel more sustainably and to have a positive impact? Absolutely. Um, exactly all of that. I mean, I always feel that conscientious travel, choose the right place that you're going to be going to, choose the people that are, are giving back and working with the communities or with wildlife. So uh, extraordinary journeys um, is very committed in protecting these areas. Uh, I think we all saw through the pandemic with our tourism, uh, we went from 2019, where there was a $50 billion industry coming into Africa, and that went down to zero during the pandemic. So what happened is we started losing um, areas that were incredibly vulnerable. Governments had laid off, furloughed, uh, retrenched. Um, you know, the anti-poaching teams, the conservancies couldn't pay for them. Many people lost their jobs. And so poaching uh, was opened up and easy. Uh, bushmeat trade opened to the point that it became a mass transnational uh, criminal organization that was uh, denuding the land. 
And, and that was one of the reasons why Great Plains got involved in Project Ranger, you know, to try and raise money and to bring the rangers back so that they could stop that extermination. So travel um, is vitally important in keeping these areas alive, keeping the communities really enthusiastic about protecting their land. So please do choose uh, the right organizations and know that, um, you know, just by being there, you might see, you might witness on, you know, firsthand what is happening, whether it's community work or conservation work. And you might be inspired to want to um, get involved in one of the projects. I mean, we have many projects at Great Plains Foundation, everything from, you know, the education all the way to something that is a, an audacious project, like uh, the uh, project um, Rewild. Um, and then just one more last question or comment. Uh, Derek, last time we chat, you chatted a little bit about, on, in line with the same question, but about people spending more time in one place, like slowing down travel. I think it'd be interesting for our clients to hear a little bit about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we're great uh, um, proponents of slow travel, where you come into one of our camps or uh, one area and move in for four, five, six days. Just slow it down. Get to know the animals there. Go out every day, find the leopard, and follow that leopard or lion, and and really understand it, rather than having to fly in, unpack your bag or don't unpack your bag, hit the game drive, come back in, have a late dinner, out again, and you're there for really one and a half days some of the time. And I don't think that's a quality experience. I think that spending time there, moving in, uh, you can check off the boxes. You can get a lion, leopard, buffalo, rhino, whatever it is in one day, but that's not really what this is about, is it really? This is really about connecting your soul to that land. Um, it's also... The reason that I think that mass tourism can have a really damaging effect on on Africa and, and tourism. But if you slow in it down, uh, that implies that you're there's going to be fewer people spending longer time there, um, picking picking the right destinations and kind of moving in. I just wanted to add then that also, I think there's probably been a question um, uh, uh, through this about where our charity is registered and the Great Plains Foundation is registered in um, in the USA it is a 501c3 and that means that uh, that for anybody who wants to donate actually the US government helps and pays as well <laughs> that was going to be my last question for you does if anybody has any <laughs> questions okay. um, feel free to type them in the chat I'll give about a, another 30 seconds otherwise um, we'll wrap it up see some people <laughs> coming to Africa is um, a lifelong experience uh, you know I just always see it as soul food uh, just being there you rejuvenate and you connect with so many uh, you know different people but you're connecting with the earth and I think that is so important so many people aren't necessarily connecting with the earth when they're in a city so coming to Africa and being part of the system and having the time, as Derek said, uh, the appreciation of actually being able to visit uh, the same lion pride a few times over and witness the cubs, you know, and just their um, strange dynamics is so important. It, those are the memories that you'll take back. And if you have the time to sit and wait and be incredibly patient, you um, are often very fortunate to be able to, you know, see something unusual that uh, possibly has never been seen before, or you might be able to see um, the lionesses going out for supper. Um, it, it happens every now and again in the Mara, more so with the cheetahs as well. So it is a unique place. I did want to add one thing, if I may. Um, the if you If anybody does want to come out, um you should book with extraordinary journeys or an agent uh we're not geared up to to take direct business there are a lot of moving parts in a safari and you really want to be in safe hands and uh if your flight is delayed out of amsterdam to nairobi or whatever that means these are complex things 
that as an operator in uh, in Kenya and Botswana and, and uh, Zimbabwe, we're just not qualified to take on. So so stick with Extraordinary Journeys. Uh, we love you and we love what you do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, we're going to have this recording available. We'll send it through on email to everybody tomorrow so you can rewatch it or share it with your friends. Um, and thank you so much again all for attending. Great. Thank you all.